Okay, so this is our talk on brain tumors and syndromes. So let's start out with a discussion on why things enhance, which might be a better way to actually think about it is why things don't enhance. So things don't enhance uh, because of the blood-brain barrier. So there'd be two basic scenarios where you, you would think about something enhancing. A, they're outside of the blood-brain barrier. In other words, they're extra-axial. That would be something like a meningioma. Or there's disruption of the blood-brain barrier. And what disrupts blood-brain barrier? Things that are aggressive. So, um, you know, a very aggressive infection or a high-grade tumor. So low-grade tumors don't enhance. High-grade tumors do enhance. So like GBMs enhance. Low-grade astrocytoma does not enhance. Now, there are a few exceptions to the rules, and obviously anytime you have exceptions to rules, that makes things testable. Uh, one of the exceptions is a, a pilocytic or juvenile pilocytic astrocytoma, or JPA. These are WHO grade 1. Now, WHO is a grading system from 1 to 4, 1 being the most mild and 4 being a very aggressive tumor. So typically, ones don't enhance, but JPAs do. Ganglioglioma's is the other major exception to a, a low-grade tumor that enhances. That isn't extraaxial. That's an intraaxial tumor. Anything that's extraaxial is going to enhance. So, so here's sort of an example. You've got gliomas that run on a spectrum, or you've got low-grade and diffuse or anaplastic. Low-grades don't enhance. Diffuse anaplastics might enhance minimally, or if any, and then GBMs do enhance, and they're the, the WHO grade 4. So as mentioned before, there are two examples or of exceptions to the rule. Making you know Exceptions are highly testable, make great multiple choice test questions, and we said that was a JPA and a ganglioglioma. So let's just talk about astrocytomas real fast. Astrocytomas can be thought about as either being diffuse or being circumscribed. The diffuse ones sort of blend into the parenchyma. You can look at this guy here where the pons is expanded like that, but you can't really see a diffuse or a discrete, uh, discrete mass. Whereas over here, uh, we're definitely seeing a discrete tumor or, or down here. So the circumscribed astrocytomas worth knowing are JPA, which is very common uh, tumor, especially in kids, that is typically a cyst with a nodule. Remember, this is one of those exceptions, even though it's low grade, that nodule tends to enhance. Now, you can also have pilocytic astrocytomas that are the optic nerve glioma that's seen in NF1. It's the same like cell grade. Um, an example of a circumscribed would be a subependymal giant cell tumor. These are, you may remember, associated with tubular sclerosis, and they arise from the lateral ventricle wall, so it enhances. So stuff that's interventricular, that also enhances, that escapes the blood-brain barrier. So any interventricular tumor is, even if it's low-grade, will enhance, generally speaking. All right, next case here, we've got a flare and a T1, seeing a lot of flare signal, but the T1 post contrast is not really showing anything that's enhancing discreetly. So this is, we think about, well, this would be broad differential. You may think about herpes. You may think about um, limbic encephalitis. Um, you may think about stroke. But you would also want to think about this, an infiltrative tumor especially one that was low grade. So this is an example of a diffuse tumor. This is glio gliomatosis cerebri, and it's defined as having tumor involvement in at least three lobes. It's that extensive T2 signal with relatively very little mass effect given how much T2 signal is there, and it doesn't enhance because it's typically low grade. All right, three cuts here demonstrating um, 
a mass that is crossing the corpus callosum, so it's crossing the midline. This is a helpful thing to think about because there's only a few things that do that. So if they show you a tumor that is crossing the midline, you should immediately think about GBMs, lymphoma, and then the trick, which is tumefactive MS plaque. Radiation can do it as well. Now, the, the, but the, fir the first three are the, the classic. So the classic two tumors that do it, think about stuff that's high enough grade to be able to do that. And then think about the tumefactive MS plaque. So what you're seeing is spread occurring along these white matter tracks like that. That's what's actually happening when you have something corpus crossing the corpus callosum. So you need sort of an infiltrative tumor that does that. GBM classically does that and lymphoma as well. All right, next case. We've got diffusion here. So, so this, this is another scenario. So we did crossing the midline scenario. This is another scenario, if they're showing it to you for a purpose of gamesmanship, you should think about your tumors that enhance or restrict diffusion, your tumors that restrict diffusion. So to restrict diffusion, you need to be hypercellular, and there are basically three that do it, but one is the poster boy. So the poster boy for restricting diffusion is lymphoma. GBM and medulloblastomas, which are high grade, can also restrict diffusion. Now you may say, well, how can I tell the difference between those? Lymphoma, just like other parts of the body, tends to enhance homogeneously, whereas a GBM tends to be like a heterogeneous mess. And then medulloblastoma you would expect in a different location in the kid. So when I say restricted diffusion brain tumor, you say lymphoma. When I say crosses the midline, you say either GBM or lymphoma. And if I say a person doesn't have a tumor, you say tumefactive MS plaque. You would be helpful to know that that tumefactive MS plaque would have an open ring with the type of enhancement that it has, right? Incomplete ring whereas a GBM would have a complete ring and lymphoma would probably enhance homogeneously. All right, here's a trick. This is another thing. So I've shown you diffusion. It's restricting diffusion. And you're like, oh, uh, the lymphoma. This is a common thing. You actually see it all the time. You probably ignore it. These are choroid plexus xanthogranulomas. They're, they sort of look like you get the idea that it might be like a mucinous looking, gelatinous looking stuff if you pulled it out of there. Restricts diffusion. It's benign. You see it commonly enough that you probably don't even notice it. It's like on 7% of all studies. Um, don't call it a tumor. It's benign. Leave it alone. So let's compare and contrast GBM and lymphoma. Sort of this is a review of some stuff that we've mentioned before. So enhancement patterns, GBMs tend to be heterogeneous. They're multiforme, right? So multiple forms, heterogeneous. Rim enhancement with a complete rim. Lymphoma, just like other parts of the body, tends to be homogeneously enhancing. They both can classically cross the midline. GBM is more classic for doing that. They both can restrict diffusion, but if you're shown a, a diffusion case, I would pick lymphoma. And the extent of disease is often underestimated with GBM. This peritumoral spread, it's always more than it looks like. That's a piece of trivia. And another piece of trivia to know about lymphoma is that it's thallium positive. And you remember, I've mentioned this a few times. Thallium is a potassium analog. It works with a sodium-potassium pump. So you have a cell that's alive, so it's going to be positive, as opposed to toxo which is, doesn't have a sodium-potassium pump that uses active transport, so it's, it's not going to be able to move the thallium across the cell. Now, the other lymphoma, I have to mention this, is this intravascular angiocentric lymphoma. These people tend to present with strokes, multiple strokes, multiple hemispheres, and they're um, so multifocal strokes, 
micro hemorrhages and some kind of lymphoma hints, then you know that's the other lymphoma. There's a trick that lymphoma can really, it's like, think about lymphoma like sarcoid. It can almost look like anything. So, but the two ways that I want you to remember it are uh, restricted diffusion mass, that's the classic lymphoma, or multiple bilateral infarcts or microhemorrhages is this angiocentric lymphoma. All right, next case. Showing you that right there. So that's a little bit of calcium, right? So what are the tumors that calcify? Now if I show you calcium in a brain tumor, you're going to say one thing. You're going to say oligo. Now in real life, the trick is that, okay, so oligodendroglium is, quote, always calcified. It's 100% by histopathology and 90% by CT. If you are shown a calcified primary tumor, then you should think about this, especially if it's in the frontal lobe and it's expanding the cortex. But astrocytomas are way more common, and even though they only calcify 20% of the time, astrocytoma is more likely to be a calcified tumor in the head. Um, but not on multiple choice. Oligo, think calcium and oligos for sure. So there is a and way to think about this is uh, old elephants age gracefully in that order um, how often they calcify. So oligos, ependymomas, astrocytomas, and GBMs. And some people will say old elephants age gracefully and like peanuts for peanuts, which also calcify. I didn't include that because I think that's probably more than you need to know for the test. So what's some trivia about oligodendrum gliomas? They calcify. I mentioned that a couple of times. It's often cortically based. It's in my cortically based differential that I'll talk about later. It expands the cortex. That's a buzzword. And it prefers the frontal lobe. So frontal lobe tumor that's expanding the cortex, cortically based with calcium in it, oligodendroglioma. Now, the most important prognostic factor, this is just pure trivia, is this 1P19Q deletion, and that is has a lot to do with how well they do as far as being sensitive to radiation, chemotherapy, and that kind of stuff. So that's the number one predictor for how well you're going to do, and it's a genetic thing. All right, next case. We've got a cortically based lesion here. So let's talk about that. I sort of hinted that I had a differential. The way that I remember these is I just remember dog, dog. Who's your best friend? Your best friend is your dog. Dnets, oligodendrogliomas, and gangliogliomas all tend to be cortically based lesions. Dnet, which is actually what this is, um, is a bubbly T2 lesion. The history is usually in uh, refractory seizures. Oligos, they are you're gonna they're gonna be shown with calcium, and if you're lucky, in the frontal lobe, expanding the cortex. Ganglioglioma's tend to be a cyst with a nodule, just like JPAs. They're another cyst with a nodule thing. Um, this is the low grade tumor that has the enhancing component. Uh, exception to the rule, the nodule, if there is a nodule, will enhance. Speaking of nodules that enhance, let's go ahead and look at this. So this is another scenario here. So we've done, just recapping real quickly, we've done crossing the midline. We said poster boy was GBM, but lymphoma and radiation can do that also. We said restricting diffusion. Lymphoma is the classic one, but GBM and medulloblastoma can do it as well. We said calcification. Think about oligo, but there's a differential. Old elephants age gracefully and eat peanuts. And then there are cortically-based lesions. Dog is the mnemonic. And now we've got cyst with a nodule. So there's a couple of things to know about cyst with a nodule. JPA in a kid. Hemangioblastoma in an adult. PXAs 
and gangliogliomas. Now, the JPAs and the hemangioblastomas tend to be infratentorial. The PXAs and the gangliogliomas tend to be supratentorial. JPA, like I said, kid, hemangioblastoma, adult. Remember, there's an association with hemangioblastomas and von hippel lindau I could show you a spine that looks like this. Notice the suboccipital craniectomy from prior tumor resection. Notice the skull is missing here, right? So they've had their uh, hemangioblastoma resected. Now with regard to telling apart a PXA and a ganglioglium, remember we said these are supertentorial cysts with nodules. The PXA classically has a dural tail. That's a buzzword associated with meningiomas, but you can see it with PXA as well. Um, and ganglioglioglioglioglioglioglioglioglioglioglioglioglioglioglioglioglioglioglioglioglioglioglioglioglioglioglioglioglioglioglioglioglioglioglioglioglioglioglioglioglioglioglioglioglioglioglioglioglio
the next step is always CT because they're leaning you towards the craniopharyngioma question. See this calcification here? Boom. Or you'll just get shown this. Um, probably don't need a next step question for it. Now, the only thing that I could say that they might ask you trivia-wise is that there are actually two different types of craniopharyngiomas. There's the childhood type that calcifies, and that's the one that I showed. There's an adult type that is more solid, um, and that's the papillary subtype. It's common. It is a common, it is the most common superpatellar tumor of childhood. So if you see a kid and you see a pituitary mass, it's probably what it is. Next step, CT. All right, this is an ant mini. This is maybe the most classic ant mini of all the ant minis. I say that because I think it's the first case in the, uh, that ant mini book, or it's at least a case that I remember standing out to me from the ant mini book. Maybe it's in the top three book. It's in another book. At some point in my life, I've seen a case like this. This is my case, of course. Um, I've seen a case like this uh, in a book. It stands out to me as very classic ant many. So what there is is there's a mass in the hypothalamus, uh, and it is a hypothalamic hamartoma, specifically in the tuber scenarium, which is the part of the hypothalamus between the mammillary bodies and the optic chiasm. Now, talking about this bad boy right here, okay, and there's a classic history that they will give you or ask you anytime they show this particular thing. There's the most classic is probably gelastic seizures, which is the laughing types of seizures, just because it sounds funny. Um, precocious puberty is actually more common, and it could be, uh, that would be the other thing that they could ask. I would expect elastic seizures for multiple choice. Okay, so we've got our next case here. And this is, we've got two fourth ventricular masses. One that looks like a ball. Um, the other one we can see is sort of, um, looks less like a ball, looks, well, looks, looks more oblong here. But let me just say that it is a softer tumor that has got like a toothpaste-like projection sort of being squeezed out. You can imagine, especially look at this one right here, that this one is round and rigid like a ball, hard ball, hard ball. Okay, so pendomoma is the soft one. Medulloblastoma is the hard one, like a metal ball, medullo ball. Okay, B for, B for ball, B for blast, B for ball. It's a blasting metal ball. So let's let's talk about the differences here. Uh, there's a differences in age. Um, pretty much all medulloblastomas are um, seen under 10 years old. They, the fact that they're spherical versus this soft tumor, highly cellular. These are the guys that restrict diffusion. Okay, I've said that a whole bunch of different times. This is in that classic restricted diffusion along with lymphoma and along with GBM. Uh, um, it's more likely to have calcium in the ependymoma. Remember old elephants, that's the E for elephants, age gracefully, and E peanuts, that's the E. Um, and this one tends to originate from the floor of the fourth ventricle, whereas um, the medulloblastoma tends to originate from the roof. So the ball is hanging on the roof. So just reiterating again, medulloblastoma, ball-like tumor, fourth ventricle, in a kid, restricts diffusion. Okay, next case. Let's run through what these sequences are real fast. So this one's T2, right? Here's a T1. This one's post-con. You can see the dura enhancing. And this one here is, um, this is also T1. It's just an, an axial T1. See, so that's dark. So this is a subependymoma. It's often 
incidentally noted, notice that it's not enhancing, it's a low-grade tumor, and it's in the inferior aspect of the fourth ventricle. So adult fourth ventricle tumor, not enhancing, hanging out in the bottom part of the fourth ventricle like that. Think about subependymomas. Cellular ependymomas are typically childhood tumors. Subependymomas are typically adult tumors. Okay? So subependymoma, WHO grade 1. Ependymoma 2 or 3. Medulloblastoma is the bad. He's the bad man. Uh, he's at WHO grade 4. And that's the one that restricts diffusion. Okay, so two tumors. Same tumor, as far as cell type, this is the same tumor as this. The difference is that this is an adult and this is a kid. Now, what do you know about uh, pediatric tumors? You probably have heard this, or if you haven't, you've noticed it before, that most pediatric tumors are infratentorial and most adult tumors are supratentorial. This is the opposite to the rule, and therefore that becomes a testable thing to think about. So whereas most pediatric tumors are below the tentorium, this particular tumor, when you see it in kids, is more likely to be in the lateral trigone. And then in an adult, where most tumors, primary tumors anyway, are supratentorial, this one likes the fourth ventricle. So it's a choriplexus papilloma or carcinoma. It's actually hard to tell the difference between these two. Another thing about these um, that you could sort of notice here too is that they tend to be associated with hydrocephalus because it's a tumor that secretes, secretes CSF. They tend to be calcified also or can be. That's not probably as important. Really enhancing a lot, interventricular tumors, adult infratentorial, pediatric supratentorial, hydrocephalus. That's what you need to know. All right, now we're going to move into syndromes. This is probably the highest yield thing you can talk about when you're doing brain tumors for multiple choice tests is like the various associations. So we're going to do syndromic associations. So this is the first one. What I'm showing you here is a lateral meningocele. Okay, lateral meningocele. Next thing I'm showing is a anterior bowing with a pseudoarthrosis. And then last thing I'm showing is a tumor of the optic nerve, expansile tumor. So put it all together and you have NF1. Now the other thing that I could have shown you is, well there's two other things, well there's three other things. One is sphenoid wing uh, dysplasia, which can have a pulsatile, um, it, can, it can be pulsatile, the, um, and, or they can show, anytime they're showing a skull or a 3D head and that the eye looks all weird, think about that with NF1. Remember that I mentioned before that NF1 can have renal vascular hypertension. And the last thing is a peripheral nerve sheath tumor. And I will tell you, just as a practical pearl, if you're thinking that it's a peripheral nerve sheath tumor or plexiform nerve fibroma in a patient with NF1, uh, it probably is. So, um, Overwhelming majority of these optic nerve gliomas are JPAs, they're, they're pilocytic astrocytomas. Now, if you have an optic nerve glioma in the wild that's not an NF1, those tend to be WHO grade 4s, they tend to be GBMs, and they absolutely demolish you. Remember that pilocytic astrocytomas are WHO grade 1, they tend to be more benign, so these are actually not the bad ones. So if I was going to pick a single thing, for multiple choice to remember about NF1, it would be probably optic nerve glioma. If I was going to pick two, it would be optic nerve glioma plus lateral meningocele. 
And if I could pick three, it would be that plus the uh, anterior tibial bowing. The other things, uh, the plexiform neurofibromas, the renal vascular hypertension, and the sp sphenoid wing dysplasia, they're certainly worth knowing. They're probably lesser high yield. All right, next syndrome. Touched on this before. We've got bilateral. See how they're going into the internal auditory canal here, here and here. So bilateral, two, one, two, NF2. And then this is showing multiple, multiple meningiomas. Notice the dural tail here. So this is miss me, NF2, multiple schwannomas, meningiomas and ependymomas. Ironically, neurofibromas are not part of NF2, even though it's, you know, the, neuro, uh, the fibromatosis, there aren't actually fibromas uh, with NF2. That's another trick, so that'd be a, a really good distractor for multiple choice. Um, which of the following, whatever, NF2, and, or which of the following is not, neurofibromas not an NF2. Doesn't make a lot of sense, therefore it uh, would make a good test question. Okay, so next one we've got here, got some, so some dark subependymal looking things, and if you squint closely, um, there are some some areas of T2 brightness here cortically, and uh, so cortical tubers tend to be pyramid shaped. Um, and then you can have these subappendable nodules that line the ventricles like this. It's a pretty classic look here. Those things, those are your tubers. So T2 bright white matter stuff with nodules along the ventricles. You could also have one of these. This is a SEGA, subappendable giant cell astrocytoma just an interventricular tumor, basically. Now, um, okay, yeah, let's do a few more. All right, so that's the brain stuff. Here are the sort of extra CNS manifestations that you think about going along with this. Fatty tumor in the kidney, right, AMLs. Round, thin-walled cysts. Lots of them, female, right, lamb. So this is tubular sclerosis. Subependymal nodules, I just remember them as dark. Most things are bright that are tumors on uh, T2. These are dark. Um, the cortical tubers are bright. Those are the pyramid-shaped, triangular-shaped looking things. Subependymal giant cell astrocytomas. Um, they're just an interventricular tumor that you see with TS. AMLs and LAM. All right, next one. One of these guys here, cyst in a nodule. What if I told you this was an adult? All right, a mangioblastoma. Remember, I've shown this a couple of times. Same tumor in the cord. All right, and then we've got a... Um, and you can have these retinal capillary hemangi hemangioblastomas just like you can get hemangioblastomas in the cord and in the posterior fossa region. Showed this in the T-bone lecture right here, what exists here. Vestibular aqueduct, what's that got right on it is the endolymph sac, so this is an endolymph sac tumor. Bilateral RCCs, tumor in the pancreas also, lots of different tumors in the pancreas, lots of different cysts also. Okay, so serous adenomas, regular cysts, islet cell tumors all occur in the pancreas. Remember pheochromocytomas, bilateral RCCs, clear cell. Renal cysts, hemangioblastoma in the brain, spine, retinal stuff, 
and in the lymph sac tumors as well. Okay. Some people will say this looks like corduroy. These sort of striated appearance here. When you see that, if you're asked for a next question, next step question, you're going to just say uh, get a mammogram or get a look at the breasts or get a look at the thyroid. I would go breasts first. So this is Cowden syndrome. This thing in the cerebellum that I was showing you is a is this Lerme duclos. It's basically a hamartoma. And Cowden syndrome is a hamartomatous syndrome, is GI hamartomas. It has breast cancer and thyroid cancer. This is the one right here, I'm telling you. Breast cancer is a hot topic. The NFL wears pink. Cowden syndrome, breast cancer. Lerme duclos looks like corduroy. Okay? There's a thing called Cowden's cold syndrome. Basically, it's Cowden syndrome plus Laramie Duclos, cold, Cowden's cold syndrome. Okay, so the next uh, next talk is going to be um, it's going to be the vascular talk, and that's it for the brain tumors.